All right, so, so uh, my turn next. My name is Martin Callanan. I'm from the um, Department of Historical Studies at NTNU in Trondheim. Um, and I'd like to talk to you today about um, an interesting case that uh, concerns uh, the relationship between uh, ritual, oh, well, ritual and spiritual objects and landscape is one of the, one of the main themes. And one of the other themes is uh, issues related to management of these kind of uh, sites and, well, objects uh, and uh, in a specific uh, context. Um, we're talking about the area in, this, in central Norway or central Scandinavia. As you know, that we have uh, two, in, two uh, indigenous populations in uh, the north of Scandinavia. They have uh, um, the, the, the Swedish and Norwegian uh, populations, but also the Sami uh, uh, indigenous populations too. Uh, it, they stretch over a large area across the national uh, borders and uh, split into various distinct uh, language groups. Uh, and um, the group that we're going to be talking about is the Southern Sami, and they have their, uh, their area across uh, the Norwegian Swedish border. and. Uh, as finds appear, there are discussions about how far south um, this area went uh, or is has gone in, in the past. Uh, the city of Trondheim is here, um, uh, and the area we're talking about is this this uh, mountainous uh, ridge uh, between Norway and Sweden. Uh, I think the landscape is uh, an important part of this story. Um, the the border between Norway and Sweden was drawn up as a result of negotiations, and the mountains themselves were used as points to draw the different uh, points along. So when you look at a modern map, they mark the boundary between these two states. But uh, the people that live there and use the, uh, the landscape and see it in another way, and the landscape appears as a, as a unit with the mountains in the middle. Uh, so from the, the mountains in the center, the landscape slopes down to two coasts on either side. So if you see, uh, for example, Southern Sami representations of maps of the Southern Sami land, that is how the land appears. It appears quite differently to the way we portray it with the national boundaries. In that respect, that we're talking about a landscape that inc includes the coast, uh, so it, it, it includes all the different ecozones across from the, uh, yeah, from the Norwegian Sea over to the, uh, to the Swedish side with the high alpine in the middle. Uh, also, if we're talking about, uh, to give you some uh, hints, if we're talking about uh, Southern Sami or Sami archaeology today, there's different. There's a couple of important point, points to highlight. Uh, we're talking about uh, relationships back past in time. We're talking about minority, majority populations. Uh, the Southern Sami have are at the at the southern end of the of these like ethnic borders, and the, and in that sense, they have that like the most active and hard uh, ethnic border where all these uh, ethnic processes have gone on in through time. Uh, there is ongoing processes in, uh, in society today about uh, uh, negotiation and, and re-establishment and, uh, of, of what, what is Southern Sami identity today and, uh, and ethnicity, and which place it will have they have as a minority in, in the Norwegian society or Swedish society, but also within uh, the Sami society, they are, they are a minority there too. Uh, dealing with the archaeology of the region, uh, or Southern Sami archaeology, what, what is Southern Sami archaeology? But it's important to recognize that there, there are uh, special sites associated with the region, and uh, they have, in some cases, a different character to the sites that we usually would encounter within, a, um, within other contexts. Um, and it's important to, that we, that we uh, learn to recognize these different kinds of sites and so on. The background for what I'd like to uh, talk about is uh, an exhibition that we have had in 2017 in cooperation with the local uh, Southern Sami Cultural Center in Snosa and some other partners. And the, the title of the, uh, of the exhibition was Who Owns the Past? And in this case, it talks directly to these power relationships and uh, this minority-majority uh, relationship that goes back in time. Specifically, this uh, exhibition focused on uh, a particular uh, Southern Sami drum that was uh, the center of the exhibition. 
in this case, ownership is, it means several different things. It means the physical, fact, the actual uh, ownership of it, but also the interpretive ownership and, uh, and so on. And there's some different levels to this title. Uh, there's not really time to go into all the, uh, the, uh, the details of the, of the use of the drum, but the drum has played a particular role in, in uh, that we, the, we in this context will call religion and ritual, but it's also important to recognize that this ritualized uh, action is part of everyday life, and that the, the ritual action is not necessarily something separate, but that it bleeds into every aspect of the lived life. Uh, in, that case, in this case, the, uh, the object has this special sense of being something unique and special, but it also is something that's embedded in everyday life. And uh, that's something, it's important to recognize that in our, our attempts to understand these objects, is that uh, the totality of the, the power of these objects, of their agency, um, and that it isn't just something that is separate and can be turned on and off, that they, they are active in, uh, in many different aspects of life. Uh, of the, I think it's towards 90 uh, extant examples that are, there are two different uh, types uh, of Sami uh, of drum that was used. There's a northern type, which is a particular character, uh, kind of a shell uh, type. In the southern Sami areas, we have this frame type, which is where the skin is, is, uh, is stretched over a round open frame. Um, there are also a, a special objects associated with the use of the, of the drum. Um, there is an object for beating for the percussion of it, but there are also uh, objects associated that will dance on the skin as it is played. Um, and the objects will move around on the surface of the skin uh, as, it, as it is beaten. Uh, there are uh, trying to uh, to learn more about how they are used and how they are viewed and so on. It's, there are source critical issues with it because a lot of the sources that we have, at least written sources, are written by a specific class of people. They are written by the uh, the, the clergy and, and and lay scientists, and there is this like filter that uh, our information has gone through a specific uh, bias, cultural bias. There is also this issue that. We, people, the Western written uh, knowledge on, we only know what people have been told. There is, we have to recognize also that there is a whole uh, system of knowledge and, uh, and understanding that we are not part of and that it still exists today. Uh, so you have to view some of this uh, information critically and also view it as, as very much incomplete and uh, only partial interpretations. Uh, the very interesting studies done of the ornamentation along the sides of the drum and some of these uh, ornamentation can be uh, drawn back quite far into uh, even into iron objects that we have recovered in, in different contexts and it's and it speaks a little bit to these ethnic processes where there's crossover of symbolism and ornamentation and so on uh, between the different groups. Uh, the skins, the drums themselves, are uh, ornately decorated on the surface. They're individually decorated. There, there, is a, there is a kind of a format or a template for it, but they are individually decorated with figures and shapes and, and so on. And, it, and they, uh, they contain both Christian and, uh, and Sami uh, symbolism. Uh, the drums, uh, some of them are, uh, have also include votive offerings. So they, they, the drums themselves are known as individuals. They have, they have their own, uh, in, uh, they have their own power. They have their own identity, and through use over a long time, they've been given uh, votive offerings to the drum itself, which is tied onto the bottom of the drum. Very often, brass objects, brass rings, and amulets, and so on. So uh, some of the best preserved drums have uh, a large uh, accoutrement that belongs to them. And as, as I'd like to, as I pointed out, I said the drum itself, although it is a unique and individual object, it is part of the everyday life, and, and it had a specific role and even a specific place within what we understand as the as, as the Sami cosmological uh, uh, life picture. It would have had a, a specific space uh, within a traditional uh, living space. Uh, some of them, as you'll see from the pictures, or you see on the way, some of them are extremely well preserved, like this example, uh, which was the centerpiece of the uh, of the exhibition. Uh, it, we know more or less where it comes from, and uh, the, and it has a connection to the landscape. It is called after uh, the place that it has come from, 
And actually, the first time that, that uh, I personally heard about it was when I was visiting this place. And, and I was told about this is the area where this particular drum came from. So the drum is known as an individual. It's got its own individual character, but it also has got this important link to the specific place where it was uh, recovered from. Uh, the background for some of this, this preservation is that the drums themselves were uh, actually forcibly collected in by clergy at different times uh, in, the, in the recent past, as partly as a sort of a, a part of a, of a sort of a missionary uh, activity, but it also seems that it's part of a sort of a power relationship that the, by gathering drums, it's a, it's a kind of a, a submission uh, by collecting the drums. And the reason that they're so well preserved is that they went from the clergy to different scientific uh, organizations around the place. So when they were collected from the local populations, they were then given to uh, yeah, clergy colleagues, scientific colleagues as, uh, as uh, exotic or as ex interesting specimens. And in that way, they've trickled into different uh, museum collections. And there are memories of, of this, in, this collection today. And when you visit villages, they will tell you that uh, this, is, uh, this is where the drums were collected. Here's an example of this uh, particular drum that uh, today is, um, is exhibited in Germany in a music museum. Uh, but and what has happened here is that the drum is gone, but that the memory of it is still connected to the, to the landscape. And uh, uh, although the relationship is broken and is weakened, it is still, uh, it's still intact, uh, this connection between uh, um, landscape and memory. I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, what's happening in recent years is that people have been recovering and discovering uh, drums in contexts within the mountains themselves. Now, not, these are not drums that are in collections around the place in the countryside or in other countries, but they are drums that were hidden as a response to this uh, forced collection. So when, when the orders came to hand in your drums, uh, some people decided we don't want to do that and we're going to uh, rather hide them in specific contexts in the mountains. And there's very interesting information emerging about what kind of context these drums are, can be found today. They are sort of liminal uh, areas, often hidden deep within sort of uh, within, um, crevices and in, 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 ma in particular mountain spots. And I've heard also mention water as a part of uh, these contexts. And people are actually trying to see a pattern in where frames can be found. Um, there's a couple of very interesting local examples in recent years where frames have been recovered. And uh, the discussion is, what should, should be done with them? Should they be taken into the muse museum? And, and, uh, and our reflex is to take them in and collect them and put them in collections. Uh, but well, part of the problem here is, and from a decolonization perspective, which it is problem, is that at, at the present uh, moment, uh, the, the into collections means into the collections of the central museums, which is actually the same, exactly the same process that we saw in the 1800s and 1700s. So when you look at it like the real material conditions, the exact same thing is happening today as happened when they were forcibly collected. In our case, this drum will actually end up in an ethnographic collection. Which is actually, which is actually quite problematic from a from a decolonizing uh, perspective, uh, and that was the background for uh, when I've been uh, looking at this collection. And then, then uh, the, these power relationships have changed, of course, through time. And there are there are, uh, of course, Southern Sami cultural uh, authorities are deeply involved in this, and they have made decisions about these. But I think that we need to discuss. Um, future collection of them? Are, are we actually de denuding uh, the landscape in a way, or breaking the relationship between the object and the landscape and have to look critically at the material, um, what actually is happening to the drums? Um, but there, there isn't any simple answer to this, and I think it's important to underline that the decision to collect in these frames was made in the end by uh, the Southern, uh, Southern Sami uh, different institutions themselves. But the question arose then at the moment, I'm told, uh, what should we do? Who are we collecting it for? Why are we collecting it? And why will it go in the museum? And in the end, they have decided to put it into the museum instead, the option being to leave it there. Um, I wonder if, uh, if we ask the question, is this the, is this the right approach? What other approach could we take? Perhaps sampling is a, 
is a suitable approach there. Perhaps you could, you could say that it has scientific value, but that in, in an attempt to leave it in the context where it is, that we could find other ways of, uh, of documenting and the sampling, but still maintaining the object landscape relationship. Um, I also think it's important to, uh, not to, <laughs> that decolonizing uh, theory or decolonizing reflexes don't become a, a theory of dominance in themselves. Uh, I think it's, of course, very important to recognize the legitimacy and the importance of actually uh, independently deciding what to do with your own heritage. And it, this is a very good example where the Southern Sami uh, authorities and, 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 and private groups have decided we want to um, um, collect it, recover it, and take it into the museum. In, in a way, that's an expression of independence. I mean, uh, uh, it's the importance of having your own uh, decision-making process. In a sense, actual the act of recovering objects itself becomes a part of uh, uh, of, uh, of, a, of an, a ritual that is archaeological recovery uh, in itself. And I think, from the perspective of power relationships, it's important also that uh, visibility is an important aspect of these minority majority uh, uh, relationships. A colleague of ours from Östersund in uh, Sweden, a Southern Sami researcher Eva Lundgall, has a title of a book that says. Uh, if we're not visible, we don't exist. So from this perspective, it is actually important to get objects in and registered and on the map. Anyway, I'll leave it there. I had uh, My intention was to show uh, some uh, perspectives on the, uh, the relationship between object and landscape within a particular mountain context, and also to show that the, some of the interesting questions that it can raise for us as, as not just as researchers, and, but also in the management and in the actual moment of discovery and so on. So thank you very much.